Okay, so we'll continue the landscape of uh, the solvers. So hopefully in this tutorial, you will learn um, all these uh, items, the uh, sparse matrix representation, the algorithm, especially dealing with the sparsity, and different types of factorization, parallelism, et cetera, and software inf uh, interface. So for, as you can see, for so far, all the solvers that we have been talking about, it's, they are all uh, algebraic. So that means uh, you deal with the matrix, so you don't uh, need to deal with uh, the geometry in the uh, most uh, part. And then you uh, heard about uh, iterative methods, Crela for multi-grid and uh, direct methods uh, is in this lecture. And they are very, very different uh, after this lecture you will see. So in iterative methods, the key kernel very often is a sparse matrix vector modification. But in the multi-grid, you saw the three matrix, uh, sparse matrix product. Uh, uh, that's uh, to set up the hierarchy, et cetera. For sparse matrix vector multiplication, it's relatively easy to optimize. And also, it has a lower arithmetic complexity under the condition that if the algorithm converges. But of course, for very numerically challenging problems, uh, you still need to use direct methods. The difficulty here is that A is modified, is factorized into the triangular matrix, for example, and you will see some other factorizations. It's uh, hard to optimize and parallelize. Uh, it has many steps. Numerically, it's a robust, uh, but uh, uh, co algorithm complexity-wise, uh, it's uh, uh, worse than the uh, iterative method uh, uh, multigrid. So um, very often, we use the direct methods nowadays to precondition iterative methods. And I think uh, earlier there was a question about uh, what do you mean by precondition? Precondition just means uh, originally you want to solve AX equals to B, right? Now you try to find another matrix M, and hopefully this M inverse is easy to do, and then to multiply, pre-multiply this. And the spectral, spectral radius of this M inverse A hopefully has a better, much better condition than you run the iterative Krelov solver for this guy. So that's the general idea of preconditioning. And also the factorization, you know, in the, uh, we are talking about uh, exact factorization, but as you saw this morning, David was talking about how this family of hierarchical matrices. You can consider that as approximate factorization techniques. So there are a lot of formats. And those, in the general sense, if you don't want a, a very accurate solution, it can be used as a direct solver. But in the more general sense, it's used as a preconditioner. So that's the, in the context here. And then um, we saw all these uh, solvers. People always ask uh, which solver I should use, whether I want to use a CG or something, or direct solver or iterative solver. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. So, the best we can do is uh, I highly recommend this uh, book, which is the uh, Template Solution of Linear System. And there's a, a, a companion book, uh, it's Template Solution of uh, Eigenvalue Problems, okay. So here you pretty much get a general guiding principle of which solver to use. In this uh, flowchart is for the iterative solver. So let's say, suppose your matrix is symmetric, and then you go to this branch, so it's, it's uh, definite, so that means SPD, then is the eigenvalue spectrum is, uh, you know the uh, eigenvalue spectrum that you try something like uh, uh, Chebyshev or CG, uh, or otherwise uh, do CG. If it's non-symmetric, go to this branch. So it's a decision tree, like uh, it's uh, useful for the you know, general guidance. But of course, if your problem usually have very peculiar things, and this just uh, give you a you know, rough guide. And then, about a direct solver, we have the similar kind of decision tree. It's depending on the, uh, what kind of uh, systems you are trying to solve. For example, if it's SPD, you do Cholesky factorization, or indefinite, you do LDL transpose with some pivoting here, and non-symmetric is general LU, and if it's non-square uh, matrix, you want to solve least square problem, you do the QR, and then of course, Talking about uh, the architecture, you can have a sequential code, shared memory, multi-core, et cetera. So you can go to this uh, link. I'm not sure whether I want to go. So I keep uh, a little survey article about a different uh, direct solvers uh, of different uh, factorization of the code. Okay, so, so this uh, little survey is actually not very long. It, the idea is just uh, for, the user, for the purpose of a user 
to see which uh, package software you want to pick up. So in this table, you can see that on the serial platform, there are a lot of options here, and the shared memory platform and distributed memory platform. So it's uh, getting smaller, smaller. And then the uh, support of these codes are not uh, uniformly you know, good. It, there's a references after each code. You can either download from the website or contact uh, the author, et cetera. Okay. So distribu the distributed memory code is uh, much harder to do, so there are not so many. And uh, in this tutorial, I will use this uh, SuperLU disk that our group uh, has been developing to just uh, do the example, uh, do the hands-on exercise. And then there are some other available there. It's all on the list. And this uh, code there, uh, SuperLU is uh, accessible from uh, PETC and also Trilino. So that's the table I was trying to show. Okay. So uh, direct solvers, uh, in, uh, generally, it's uh, not uh, sensitive to any uh, numerical, underneath numerical difficulty. So it can support a very wide range of applications. And in general, for example, SuperLU is dealing with a non-symmetric matrix. Uh, so the problem can be indefinite, can be very ill-conditioned. It doesn't matter too much. And very often, when we talk about sparse matrices, especially from a PDE simulation, you, you can think about uh, uh, your matrix A could have dimension like a ten, a one million or even more nowadays. But uh, whenever, even though you increase the problem dimension, but you, you don't increase the number of non-zeros per row. That depends on your PDE, the three-dimensional geometry, for example. So the number of non-zeros per row is a state constant. Uh, that's in the A matrix, but in the LU matrix is a different story, which we'll see. And then the, uh, for algebraic solver, we can support a different uh, sparsity pattern. So for example, this is a very nice uh, structured matrix uh, eigenvalue problem from uh, air, uh, airplane design. And then this is the chemical process, uh, the sparse matrices of chemical reaction. They may have different interactions, so the sparsity pattern will be very different. It's unstructured. So you need to be able to deal with this uh, with a good uh, uh, matrix uh, representation. OK, so that's what leads to this uh, sparse data structure, which uh, Ulrika earlier mentioned this compressed row, sparse compressed row. I just want to give you a little bit more concrete what it is. So suppose you have a matrix here, which is uh, uh, seven by seven matrix, uh, so many non-zeros, the other zeros you don't need to store. So what you do in compressed row, you do row-wise storage. So it's, this is the numerical values of 1A to B, you know, all these, and divided by column boundary here. And then each of these non-zero has a column index. Uh, in this case, in Fortran, we use a one-based index. And the important thing is this row pointer. So if your dimension is seven, you need the eight entrance here. Each of these entrance points to the beginning of each uh, row here. So with this uh, three, a set of three things, uh, you, you are able to access uh, each matrix element. And obviously, when you do compress the row, it's better to do traverse the algorithm traverse in this way. And if you want to traverse column-wise, so you, you have to do the compressed column. You won't be able to do random jumping in this data structure. So then, uh, again, I'm advertising this template uh, book. It has uh, uh, explained some other data structures, some other packages use, OK? And then what about a distributed in input interface? Also for algebraic uh, solver, we, only, we have A matrix, B matrix, uh, right-hand side. And internally, we have a LU factored matrix. So that's what uh, uh, we can take a look. So A is a sparse, and the B usually is a dense, right? B could be one vector or multiple uh, right-hand side multiple vectors. So usually we do this uh, distributed to compress the row. So each local, so I have uh, three processes here. Each local part will be compressed the row, OK? And then B and uh, X, solution X will be partitioned conformally with uh, this uh, uh, row-wise partition. So each processor, you only have those data. You don't see the others. But then you need uh, some data structure to represent this. So the only difference is uh, in addition to local, you have this uh, set of three vectors, right? But then you need to say the local number of non-zeros, the local block size, the number of blocks, number of uh, uh, rows of uh, local processing, and also the first row. So with this information, all the processes, they can aggregate 
exchange information to figure out, piece together, what's the global matrix look like. So that's the uh, small five by five example distributed on two processes here, P0, P1. So you can say that on processor P0, I will give local number of non-zero is five. And then the M local, the row dimension, I have two, the first row is zero. But on processor one, the first row will start from two. So in this case, I'm doing zero-based indexing in C case. So with this setup, the two processors, they will communicate to piece together what the global matrix look like. And the complication is internal, but that's something you don't need a user, from user point of view, you don't need to worry. It's the LU factored matrices. Because in general, usually you don't need LU factor, you just need to get back a solution X. But we do need to take care of this LU factor. And in order to get a scalability, we use this 2D block cyclic layout. So that means the processes are arranged as a 2D block cyclic, like this six processes. You try to do as square as possible. If it's not possible to be square, you give row dimension slightly smaller than the column dimension. So that, because in the algorithm, we have more communication along here. So that's the general rule. And it's the same as scalar pack, uh, the dense linear algebra package that you probably have heard from uh, Jack Dungera from uh, last week. So that's the uh, example here. And in this LU pattern, you can see that uh, I have uh, some, we try to identify blocks so we can do blast three operation. And all these zero part we don't store, we only store these uh, dense blocks. 2D block cyclic like this. So that's the, uh, with this uh, distribution, hopefully you get a very good uh, load balance and also the, um, at once you get uh, elimination towards the end, you still, every process still has work to do. Okay, so now let's move to the uh, Gauss elimination. Are there any questions about the uh, structure, data structure, et cetera? Okay. So Gauss elimination is actually a very powerful uh, algorithm, and especially for dense matrix, uh, it's uh, probably the best to solve a linear system. So uh, you have start with the matrix A here, and then you eliminating along the diagonal. For the first step, you, this is a scalar alpha. You divide this alpha into the column vector, and then use this uh, column vector to multiply with this row vector to perform this uh, update. So update into the trailing n minus one by n minus one, and this guy we call short complement. But the interesting thing I want to point out is uh, suppose the alpha is very small, very tiny. So then you, after you divide into the normal number, you get uh, this guy becomes uh, huge. This huge number added into a normal number, then some of the uh, quantity in the B matrix will be lost. So that's where the instability coming from. When people talk about we need a pivot, that's why it is. So it means that uh, when you have a small pivot, you want to, maybe it's not a good pivot to choose. You want to do row swap or column swap to make this diagonal guy to be big before you do the uh, elimination. So in the end, you actually factor a permuted matrix, both the row and the column. So that's the idea of uh, stability. And then after you, the first step, you do the, this elimination for this short complement, keep doing. In the end, you get a two triangular matrices, L and U. After that, you can do the um, triangular solve, which is much cheaper. So that's the uh, mathematical algebraic uh, Gauss elimination. But then put into the sparse matrix, uh, it's getting more complicated. So the first thing to note that uh, here, I have a sparse matrix here. The, Black dots, they are non-zeros to begin with in your A matrix. But when you do each of these uh, rank one update to form the short complement, some of the red dots will form. So red dot is, means that in the beginning, this location is zero. But because of the non-zero here and then non-zero here, then you will form this uh, red dot. It's probably better to use this, okay? So these uh, red dots we call filling elements, and uh, it, it will, you will need a data structure to accommodate the storage for these red dots, which you don't know before for your A matrix. So that's in the LU matrix. 
And typically, it's not very good news. Typically, for 2D problems, you can get the field ratio is a, could be a factor of 10. For 3D, large 3D problems, this field ratio could be several hundred, the worst uh, you know, we have seen. Meaning that uh, the number of non-zeros in LU divided by number of non-zeros of A could be as large as uh, 100, 200. So it takes a lot of storage. That's why it's uh, from mathematical point of view, it's uh, not a linear scaling algorithm unlike a multigrid. And then um, echoing what uh, David was talking about earlier from algorithm classification, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's, uh, so the sparse matrix actually, it's very nice. You can formulate uh, using this uh, task graph, you know, DAG, and in the multifrontal case, it's the tree. And then your parallel computing, you will just uh, need to schedule your computation along this DAG. So you see different code. For SuperLU, we're using this uh, supernodal code, and which uses this uh, DAG. And multifrontal code, for example, like a strong pack mumps, they use this uh, uh, multifrontal tree to schedule the computation. And mathematically, if you write down, it's really the different way of uh, computing the short complement. In the supernodal code, which we compute the short complement, update directly in place, so you need less memory. But in the multifrontal code, these little short complement, they are actually accumulated along the way. Only when you get to each node here, then you need to do the elimination of this frontal matrix, then you collapse them, so it's accumulated there. So all these little accumulation, it takes more memory. So that's the main difference between the supernodal multifrontal code. Okay. So once you know this uh, sparse matrix, uh, you know, the computation, the difference from st dense matrix, then you will see that uh, there are algorithms, they, they are uh, different uh, phases. Uh, so first uh, phase is important, is uh, you want to find a good ordering, permuting the matrix equations, variables, so that you minimize those uh, number of uh, red dots generated. So this is the problem of uh, minimizing filling. And in general, to get the optimal ordering is NP-complete. So we always use a heuristic. I'll show you a couple of uh, heuristic. And then once you fix uh, the order, then you have to determine where are those red dots, the filling occur, to design your data structure. So that's something usually called a symbolic factorization. And then you get the data structure, find the super nodes, dense substructure, et cetera. So all these uh, three steps, they are combinatorial, symbolic, uh, you know, doesn't involve numerics. And only after that, you get to something which is similar to what you do in a dense matrix, do numerical algorithms, factorization, and uh, triangular solution. And time-wise, uh, this uh, usually takes, uh, dominates the whole solution phase. So that's why you see most of the algorithm, parallel uh, algorithms, uh, they are dealing with uh, this phase. But of course, uh, according to Amdahl's law, you learned that if you don't deal with this, uh, then you go, don't get, uh, you know, good speed up. Okay, so the pivoting uh, I mentioned, it's you don't want a diagonal element to be small. But in the sparse case, it's uh, always complicated. So for example, here, I, when I, you, you do the elimination at this step, suppose you have a small element here or a big element here, and then you want to swap these two rows, right? But then you can see that after depending on whether you swap or not. If you don't swap, your sparsity pattern will be given here. But if you, and then when it affects the row, will be generated two non-zeros of this guy. But after you swap, then the pivot row is this three guys, has these three, and they multiply together with that one will generate a three non-zeros here. So depending on which pivot you use, the sparsity pattern of the short complement will change. So that's why dynamic pivoting, like partial pivoting, people use it very stably in dense code. It's actually not so good because you, every step you have to change your LU data structure for the training sub matrix. So in sparse case, people uh, use something else also. So for example, in the sequential code, we can deal with the dynamic data structure easily. I mean, more easily, so, so then we use uh, uh, partial pivoting. But in the very scalable distributed memory code, actually we use a static pivoting. So that means that before factorization, we run a maximum weight bipartite uh, matching algorithm to find a good pivot, large elements on the diagonal. 
which is based on the graph of matrix A. It doesn't have knowledge of LU. But then once you get that, you hopefully, when you do the LU factorization, you don't need to pivot anymore. So then it's in the middle, if you still have a tiny pivots, you can replace by a single precision perturbation, which still doesn't affect stability very much. So there are some tricks in terms of pivoting. And it's important to know because sometimes you don't get a very accurate solution. There are reasons and need to go back to, to the code, maybe change those options to investigate. So now we look at uh, some uh, heuristic of uh, uh, ordering to preserve sparsity. So generally, right now, the two popular uh, classes of algorithm, one is a local greedy type, one is a global divide and conquer uh, algorithm. So the local greedy type is uh, very simple to explain. Suppose at the first pivot here, you do Gauss elimination you need to have this column vector, row vector, they need to multiply together. So that means after this eliminate this guy, you see you will generate this dense submatrix corresponding to IJK, those indices, right? And then looking at the adjacency graph, it just means that this one is connected to IJKL, right? So in the beginning, IJKL, they are not connected. But after one is eliminated, all the neighbors of one will become a clique, fully connected. It's called a clique in computer science uh, uh, term. So what you want to, so this clique, this red edges corresponds to the red dots generated. So you want to minimize the, each step, minimize the clique, gen, the, the clique size generated. So that's what they say. Suppose you pick up the vertex with a degree which is the lowest among your the entire graph, then hopefully your clique generated at this step is the smallest. And then you just keep doing like this. So that's the uh, local uh, greedy. But this doesn't uh, guarantee any optima optimality. So that's the disadvantage of this. And then the advantage of the other uh, heuristic is the global uh, nested dissection. It's top-down approach. And uh, originally, when um, Alan George invented uh, this uh, algorithm, this ordering algorithm, his uh, motivation actually came from uh, geometry. So for example, if you solve this uh, uh, Poisson equation to, in 2D geometry, then what you do is that uh, you find the separator here. After these uh, vertices were removed, then the graph is uh, divided into two pieces. Okay, And then what you do is you put this uh, separator towards the end, move them towards, towards the end. And for the first part, you also continue to find the separator, which re represented by this uh, 10, this number. And then the next one represented by 20. So you put them like this in the nested way. So that part, uh, you still have a representative with four and then the eight on that side. So you can see that uh, with this uh, ordering, actually, you can show for this uh, 2D geometry, actually, any planar graph it, you get optimal order in terms of uh, amount of field. And this is generalized uh, to 3D uh, finite difference uh, uh, scheme. The optimality is, uh, is uh, proved. So then you can generalize this uh, to you know, an, any algebraic way. So suppose you are given any graph, any graph here. You, all you need to do is to find the separator at the top level, put the separator vertices here, and then find the uh, two pieces, uh, find the separator, continue you know, doing the nested way. And the different uh, packages, for example, you are familiar with uh, Metis, uh, Scotch, you know, these are popular packages. It's the different way of finding separator at each level. And then there's uh, also some uh, uh, spectral, you can use the eigenvalue algebraic uh, uh, linear algebra to help you find the uh, separator. And then there's some uh, geometric way to do that. So there, the, the goal is really to find uh, this uh, separator as small as possible. Because if separator is small, zero block uh, will be maximized. And when you do elimination, this uh, zero blocks uh, will be preserved. So it will be very clear from uh, this picture. So this is a relatively bigger mesh, a 2D mesh. And then if you do the natural ordering like this, you get this nice banded structure. But then the, when you do Gauss elimination for this banded structure, everything within the band will be filled, will be all red dots. On the other hand, if you reorder using this nested dissection ordering with this uh, structure, so you can see that the field, the zero, dot, zero guys, uh, the red dots, they are 
populating only along this, uh, all these uh, different uh, separate, different level of separator. So it's uh, when you do the LU factorization, this guy actually has uh, fewer non-zeros compared to that one. Okay, so I think I will skip a lot of these. Uh, it's all in the slides. You can take a look at uh, for unsymmetric matrix. Uh, we try to symmetrize the matrix to apply the symmetric ordering algorithm. Still the same thing. And then the in the uh, ultimately what you do the LU factorization very rarely you factor a matrix. So you actually factor some uh, transform the matrix. In here I have a diagonal even the diagonal equilibration matrix and then the row permutation, column permutation to preserve uh, numerical stability and preserve sparsity, et cetera. So then in SuperLU, for example, you have the options. <coughs> row permutation can use uh, several options. It's a sequential or parallel, and the column permutation could use a minimum degree or use the metis uh, or parallel metis or Zoltan, et cetera. Okay, so I just want to give you some uh, example about the performance before we take a look at the uh, hands-on exercise. So this is the uh, recent work is uh, we try to speed up a triangular solve uh, using uh, synchronization avoiding uh, technique. And currently you can get this code from this GitHub uh, tri-solve branch. It will take some time to integrate into the master. So the triangular solve uh, early days, people didn't pay attention because it takes a very, it's very fast. It's about, uh, say, less than 5% of the time compared to factorization. But now, since we're using this uh, uh, factor, the matrix, uh, more used like a precondition. So that means uh, for each factorization, you need to solve many, many times uh, in the Kralov uh, iteration, for example. So sometimes one factorization, you need a 50th solve. Then triangular self become dominant. So that's why it's uh, still important to improve the scalability. So what we uh, did now is uh, to use some, uh, take advantage, fully take advantage of the sparsity of each column and each row. So we use the asynchronous tree-based uh, broadcast uh, reduction tree to do communication. So you can see that the performance uh, for example, in this picture, I gave you four different uh, matrices, and the, each color corresponds to one, and the dotted one corresponds to the old time. Then the solid line is the new time. So for this uh, one matrix, uh, one, by the time you get to 4,000 uh, processes, you can see the speed up uh, over four times when you do this uh, more asynchronous uh, algorithm. And another thing is uh, recently we have done is also you know, in the spirit of avoiding communication that uh, Jim uh, has, uh, you know, gave a lecture about that. And earlier today, David has talked about uh, also the uh, avoiding communication. And uh, here we, it's the first time actually this uh, avoid, uh, uh, communication avoiding 3D algorithms uh, did for the sparse uh, LU factorization. And what you do is uh, when you do the 2D process layout for LU, you run out of uh, parallelism. So what you do is uh, you configure the processes in 3D, 3D. So you, 2D has a plane, right? Then you replicate this plane so that you have a 2D, each slice is a 2D, but then you replicate along Z direction. So without going into the algorithm details, we can see the performance here is that uh, on the bottom here, I just the PZ direction if it's one, so I'm using the 2D uh, layout. And here the performance I'm giving you is teraflop rate. So you can see that from 24 to 768, I have uh, processes from 32, um, you know, 32 fold more processes, but the speed up, uh, I got only two X speed up. So it's, you don't have enough parallelism. But then you configure 3D with along PZ direction. So for example, if you look at the, uh, along the diagonal, this is the same constant number of processes, but with different configuration, you can get a much more speed up. So here from 2D to 3D, you see 23 fold speed up. So it's very significant. And then we also did uh, GPU. Um, combining with this uh, 3D algorithm, which is a very recent uh, thing. So you can see that a 3D algorithm with a CPU plus GPU and compared to a 3D algorithm of a CPU, you get a speed up of uh, up to 3.5 or some 
you know, quite good. And this one is only one node. It's the uh, Oak Ridge machine. It's the Titan has a one node, only one GPU. But the next challenge is this Summit machine. You heard it's one node has a six GPU. That's something we have to deal with the, the programming. So these are the slides you can see installation, et cetera. The performance of critical part is really the BLAST uh, library. And then something I didn't talk about is this uh, hierarchical matrix, uh, the new kind of uh, inex inexact direct solver. It's uh, the, from the user point of view, the usage is very similar to direct solver, to super LU. So that part is simple, but the only thing is you need a t drop tolerance. If you drop more, then it becomes less and less uh, accurate, but become a preconditioner. So that's some performance. So I think, uh, and that's the software summary and some references. So, so for example, one of the you can go to the one one of the ten hour lecture I gave uh, a few years ago at the Jean Gallup Summer School. So you can take a lot of material there. So this you can go to the hands on sessions lessons the SuperU MFM here. First, uh, it's the our lovely uh, convection diffusion. Yeah. So it's a, it's a slightly more complicated, more difficult. So that's the website. Uh, the equation you are solving for this example is this uh, convection diffusion equation. And then the, so the first example is set up to run it uh, with uh, GMRES and with Hyper, this uh, Boomer R, uh, AMG as a preconditioning. The velocity is uh, 100. So you want, you want to, it's basically a fluid flow problem, fluid flowing to the right. Uh, to my, yeah, our, to, to our yeah, right there, yeah. and, uh, and the velocity of the fluid changes the condition of it. So the velocity, when it gets uh, bigger, bigger, if you set velocity bigger, so for example, the second wrong, when you set velocity to be 1,000, then you see that the uh, GM rest with hyper will not converge very well. So here in the first case, you get a residual norm, which is double precision accuracy, 10 to the minus 16, but uh, with uh, uh, 1,000 uh, velocity, you get uh, much smaller. Okay, so then let's uh, see if this residual is not happy. We're not happy with this, so we switch to direct solver. So we run this. This is, uh, this is an animation of just showing what's happening with GM res if we increase the velocity. So it's done. So eventually the velocity gets bad enough that the it goes, it blows up. So you won't just get any correct. And then the solution time for GM rest, the precondition GM rest, when velocity gets bigger, then you just goes up quite a bit. Now we switch to direct solver. And the first, the round three here, I'm using the natural ordering. So it's this guy, the column perm is a zero, which is the natural use by row, not a minimum degree, not a nasty dissection. So you can see that the number of non-zeros here is about uh, you know, two, two, uh, what is two million, over two million of uh, L and U. It's unsymmetric, you see it's unsymmetric. L and U, they have different number of non-zeros. And then time, it shows different uh, uh, phases of the algorithm. So there's a row permutation time, symbolic factorization time, uh, distributed the LU matrix time and the, also the column permutation time. In this case, because we're using natural ordering, so there's not column permutation time. But remember the time now is 18 seconds. The next wrong you will do is this. Convection diffusion with a velocity 1,000, but with a CP column permutation is two, which is the uh, minimum degree ordering on A plus A transpose. So then you should see the number of non-zeros is much, much smaller. So remember the number of non-zeros with the natural ordering is over two million. Now it's only, uh, let's say, one, one million, okay? And time-wise, now it's uh, 0 0.05. So now it's already comparable to the iterative solver time because uh, in the first round, remember the iterative solver, iterative solver, we're using 0 0.04, right? So now with the minimum degree ordering, you're already 0 0.05 factorization, so it's getting quite good. And then the next one is using the uh, uh, nested dissection ordering. Okay, so this uh, column perm 
is the four, which is Nessie dissection ordering. So you number of non-zeros is even further reduced by some. But if you get a problem size is much bigger, getting larger, larger, Nessie dissection should be even better. Okay, so then the this one is we are trying to show is the a larger problem. So here I'm using the mesh refinement is a three, so you get the problem size is uh, more than half a million here. So it's taking every zone in the original problem and subdividing by three in each dimension, so it's 64 times as large. So the factor time is uh, much bigger now. It's uh, about nine, 10 seconds, okay? And then for the same, this uh, over half a million, if you run this uh, with uh, uh, 16 processes. Oh, by the way, if you are reserved only one node, you better not to run 16 processes because uh, each node has only 12 cores. So the, you'll be very slow. You can run 12 to do the experiments. But when I did uh, these experiments, I reserved uh, two nodes. So with the 16, you can see that uh, factorization time is reduced from uh, about 10 seconds. Now it's about 1.6. I mean, it's not a strong scalability. It's not very good yet. But the problem is still not uh, very big. Okay. So let's see. So then there are some uh, other. Um, uh, the, this last example is uh, Suppose you have a multiple right hand side, but you, oh, your matrix A is the same, and the B is different. So, which means that uh, you can reuse a lot of information. For example, the ordering for sparsity, that's the same. You don't need to recompute. And the LU factorization, in this case, you don't need to recompute. You just need to do the solve. So, that's what's happening with this is uh, the option is uh, minus two RHS right hand side. So the first factorization is the same as you just saw, but when you solve the next one, you can skip all the factorization, all the symbolic factorization, et cetera. You only need to solve a different B using the same LU factor. So the solve time is the same, but you save a lot of, uh, reuse a lot of uh, the other information you have computed. So let's uh, see, basically in the example here, this evening, if you do, it's, uh, you know, when you do the standalone example under the subfolder, super LU uh, dist, you will see those examples. The first one is solve one linear system. The second one is the solve system with the same A, but different right-hand sides. And you just change the options. And this one will reuse the factored form of A. And PD drive two is you can solve the system with the same pattern as A, same sparsity pattern, numerical values are different. So that in that case, in that case you can reuse the sparsity ordering, for example, the minimum degree, uh, Nessie dissection, those ordering you don't need to recompute. And you only need to recompute the numerical value. So that example tells you how to set that up. And the last example, for example, this PD drive four is very useful, is you can divide the processes, all the processes into multiple groups. In this case, I divide it into three groups. So I'm doing each of the parallel direct solver on this block matrix, block diagonal, and then use this as a preconditioner for the whole, for the whole matrix, you probably run the GM res, but then you use the block diagonal block Jacobi preconditioner to do this. And then each of these is one instance of parallel super LU. So that's the example set up in PD drive four, which you can take a look. Yeah, so, so basically direct solver, people always say it's a black box solver, so you could just uh, plug in. But as you can see, uh, you know, I show you a lot of these internal different ordering, you know, but stability issue. It's actually not so black box. So when you run it using the default option, you may not get a very good result. So you have to play with these different options. So when you reuse the factored form of A, so you, when you're changing the different right-hand sides, right. so, you, so you store how you factored it or because you need to know how to permute the elements in the right-hand side. <coughs> Uh, because uh, A, for, for example, if the first time, if, if you already factored A, you know the permutation you have used. 
then you can pre use that to apply to the right hand side. So in the static pivoting, yeah. when you have um, you replace the tiny pivots by this square root of x, right. is the a uh, time dependent or is it the, uh, the beginning of a that you have? It's only on the diagonal. Yeah, it's only perturbed the diagonal. Yeah.